Hey everyone, I'm Dave Wood and this is Semiosis 101. Welcome to the special fourth Omnibus edition on General Pershing Semiotic Theory for Illustrators and Designers. In this fourth Omnibus we have three episodes back to back focusing in on Pierce's three levels of the object's representament or in Semiosis 101 designer centric terms, the visual representation of the concept to be visually communicated by applying effective semiotic sign action. Yes, we are talking about exploring iconic, indexical and symbolic representation. In video one, I will show how manipulating iconic representation in your ideation phase will help you improve how you visually hook your target audience. Then, in video two, a more in-depth examination of indexical representation and how you can change your designing and illustrating forever by really crafting your visual language to connect more with your audience. Finally, in the video three, we will see why logos can't work without understanding semiosis and symbolic representation. Now, if you prefer to watch the videos individually, you can on this Scouscott Semiosis 101 channel, or stay tuned and watch them all in order in this Omnibus. We begin this omnibus with a video on how I show that by manipulating iconic representation in your ideation phase, it will help you improve how you visually hook your target audience. In this first video, we will dig deeper into the, the lowest level of semiotic representation in semiosis, iconic. In order to understand in pragmatic semiotic terms what iconic representation is and how it functions in illustration and graphic design. The icon in a piercing context is not what you as illustrators and designers understand icon to mean. You will see when we discuss iconic representation its piercing meaning differs from your understanding and your, your application of the word iconic. So it is important to begin today with an open mind. After all, words in different social cultural contexts have different meanings. And Peirce wrote his pragmatic semiotic theory in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So to understand iconic representation in semiosis, in order to know how to apply it into visual communication design, you must bracket out any other definitions for the next 10 minutes as we explore iconicity. So stay tuned, subscribe, let's go. Hey, okay, so here we are. In this week's talk, we're gonna be focusing in on iconicity. And what we mean by iconicity is the the first starting point of semiotic communication as far as graphic designers and illustrators are concerned, which is the iconic semiotic representation. Now, this level of semiotic representation of the concept that we want to communicate is only one dimensional, and it is the lowest level at which a semiotic sign is perceived by our target audience. Now that is important, our target audience, because that's who we're really talking about in these talks, really, is about how can you craft your visual communication using Persian semiotic theory to enhance how you effectively communicate to your target audiences, whoever they are. Now, in this, obviously, we're going to be focusing on illustration and graphic design as our examples while talking about iconicity. So really what we are going to be using is examples of real designers and real illustrators sketchbooks and they're taken from these two books by Stephen Heller and the links of these are in the description below so we've got Stephen Heller's graphic which is about graphic design sketchbooks and comic sketchbooks and from these two books the examples I've taken are 
um, in the slides. But the, the links to these two books are in the description below. So check them out. OK, so let's move forward then. Iconicity, representing qualities. We've already established in previous videos that at iconic level, that is when interpretation from our target audience begins. What we mean by that is, as designers, your first sort of visual communication task is to get the attention of your target audience to look at what you've designed or illustrated. And that's obviously done a lot through the aesthetic choices of the visual language you designed on and how you put things together aesthetically. And in that aesthetics is the semiotics. But when it comes to grabbing the tension of our target audience, we're not talking here about a leaflet which says, you know, buy your big beans at the local supermarket. You know, we're not talking about denotative understanding of what they're looking at. If they want beans, they can go to the supermarket and buy beans. But we're talking in the realms here of brand, and we're talking in the realms here of advertising, we're talking in the realms of more effective, connotative meaning in your work. And making the audience work that little bit harder to get more reward from what they're looking at. So connotatively, semiotics helps you as designers and illustrators make connections through allegory, through metaphor, whatever it is you want to use to get across the big idea that's coming from your client's brief. Now, your client is obviously who you're working for. The brief is what you're working from. And in the brief is the message that your design and illustration needs to visually communicate in some form or other. And that's obviously got to be to a target audience. And that target audience, you've got to research, you've got to find out who that target audience is, what makes them tick, and what makes them so like connectable from your perspective, so you can hook them in. So if the audience you intended doesn't get interested in your work, then semiotics doesn't get a chance to work. If they only see it at the denotative level, then they're only going to see what it is and then move on. They're going to go buy a tin of beans. But in advertising, they don't just go buy beans. They, they bring it around in a lot of different ways to tell a story, to tell a narrative, to get an emotional response from their audience. And in a way, even though you might not be working in advertising or even in branding, that is something that you want to, I'm going to use a term here from a design company, Carcamassa, Bake it into your design. And this is your way of doing that through semiotics to help you craft it. Because if the audience doesn't spot something that has a resemblance to something that they already know, something they're interested in, then they're going to walk away and semiotics doesn't get a chance to start working. And that's what we mean is that at an iconic level, that interpretation begins, that semiotic interpretation. If you don't get it, you're going to carry on walking. If they do get it, then we've got something to work on semiotically to craft, to get more meaning from the work that you do, to be more effective in the visual communication that you are producing. Okay, so iconic representation if it's to grab attention of our target audience, then as designers and illustrators, you can only convey a possibility of making that connection using something relevant in there to hook our target audience in. So you're looking for sheer qualities that Pierce refer re refers to as like that thing and used as a sign of it. So the semiotic sign is something that represents the thing we want to communicate. Okay. So really what we're talking about here is the iconic representation is the very basic building blocks of everything. So here's two examples here. We've got Sean Adams color um, notes in his sketchbook using Pantone colors. And then on the left-hand side, you can see within the layout, 
color combinations to create a vibe, a tone, a feel. No detail in there yet, but it's just something to try and emotionally grab attention. That's iconic. And we got Carol Tyler, illustrator Carol Tyler, obviously doing some sketching of potential um, compositions for a party scene. How do we know it's a party scene? Well, there's a big giveaway within all of this figure movement is the fact that they're wearing party hats. But they're not party hats, it's just a triangle, it's just a couple of lines and a few little embellishments. But if you know what a party hat is, you can see it's a party hat, you can put it in the context of the figure movements, and you know that these figures are in a party situation. So that's iconic level of representation within illustration and graphic design already working. Let's move on. Professor T Tony Jappy, a real scholar in piercing semiotics says, iconic representation of a concept is the lowest subclass that can operate as a sign. And only when it has a referring concept to be interpreted. Now, obviously I'm talking here in designer centric terms. So what I've done is I've just replaced in yellow the word object in Tony Jappy's quote. And there's his book there, which is the link in the description as well to his book. Check his book out. So in that, what we're talking about here is for something iconic to work, it's got to be related to the message, the, me the meaning of which you want to visually communicate to our target audience. Again, that determination flow, concept, object, those two things are the same. Representation, representament are the same. And interpretant and interpretation are that sort of like pairing of designer centric terms and piercing terms together. Okay. So what we're talking about here is obviously the concept and how the concept is represented. There's no point in representing the concept using things that our target audience have no connection to whatsoever. What do we mean by that? Okay, let's just look at these examples here from um, Joseph Lambert. So we can see in a sketchbook, there's typographical layouts using just shapes, but let's just focus in on like these pen shapes at the bottom, the, the, the writing and drawing implements at the bottom. We can see a square, okay? but they're just like lines forming what we perceive as a square. So if we've seen a square, we know when we see something like that, even though they're not right angles, it's referring to a square. So iconically it's working. But then we see all these red shapes all working in blocks of color of red and the negative space. So we're talking about here, the figure and ground, gestalt theory, figure and ground, the negative space forces our eye into the shape of the red blobs, which if you know what a fountain pen looks like, the second one along starts to look like a fountain pen. The fourth one along, if you look at the fourth one along and you know what a brush pen looks like, then all of a sudden that starts to make a connection to us going, ah, that's a, a brush pen. And the other two are maybe markers of some form or other, or even crayons. It's still very, very rough drawings that he's still only trying to work out what these things are. But iconically, we can start to see just these shapes and colors all of a sudden, and the negative shapes as well, all of a sudden communicating something to us that we know we've experienced. We've experienced pens, we've experienced crayons. Even if you don't know what each of them are, you can at least get to the point of they are writing or drawing implements. All of a sudden, these just a few marks of red on paper, all of a sudden start to represent things that we know. Iconic representation. We know it relates back to drawing implements. So we know that these lines together in this way is telling us something about drawing or writing. If we didn't know what these shapes were, we wouldn't make the semiotic connection and they would just still be blobs as far as we're concerned. We wouldn't be able to interpret what they were. Let's move forward again. Tony Jappy, 
Iconic representation can only relate to a concept by qualities as it resembles a concept through the association of shared qualities, whether that concept exists or not. Okay, let's unpack that again. Iconic representation can only relate to a concept by qualities. We're talking here, obviously qualitatively, we're not talking here quantitatively about facts and figures and things like that. We're talking about feelings and tapping into feelings and things that our target audience have experienced in their lives that you can visually pull into your work as visual hooks to get their attention for us to then work later on getting more and more information out of your visuals and your designs. Those qualities, when you do that in your work, resembles those things that they are aware of. When I say resembles, what do I mean? Well, we just had an example of that. Of just a few brush strokes in red resembles marker pens, um, fountain pens, brush pens, pens in general, crayons maybe. So here we've got a couple of examples again of we have uh, Brendan Leach, a little sketchbook of observational drawings, just lines, just lines, just lines. But in those lines put them together, we get to see that you can see a shoe, you can see a jar, we can see a glass, we can see a bottle, you know, we can see the back of somebody's head. But they're just lines. That's all they are. They're just lines. They're just iconic lines. They're put in a particular way, makes a connection to us that we can see because we know what, you know, shoes and glasses and jars and people's heads look like. Then we got Michael Bay Root's little sketches of letter forms. Just working on, you know, just very, you know, quick little thumbnail sketches. But those little lines put down in a particular way iconically connect to letter forms that we know, like the M. Okay, we can see an M there. We can see that, you know, that M is being sketched out, but it's still something that resembles an M. It's got the qualities of an M. It's got the uprights. It's got the diagonals. It resembles an M. And from that, we can make an interpretation of they are M's. Okay. Then we got Runry in his example here of these padlocks, because they resemble padlocks, but it's still only drawings, but padlocks and faces, putting faces and padlocks together, making the keyhole of the padlock, the nose of the, the face, all of a sudden, you can start to make characters out of padlocks or opposite way around, I suppose. So, obviously, a padlock figure with a face doesn't exist. But the shoes and the glasses and the jars and the bottles do, and letter forms do. So, iconic representation isn't just of things that are in existence. They are things that we know that when we put things together, juxtapose different things together, all of a sudden new meanings happen. And that goes right back to the dawn of humankind. We've had this ability for abstract thinking and semiotic theory, Persian semiotic theory just builds on that innate humanness of being able to spot patterns with gestalt and from that to actually start applying those patterns in a particular way as a sign for something else, a bigger idea, a bigger concept that you're not denotatively saying, right, this is this. You're saying, ah, look at this. This is that. Well, if you get to that, great. But if you don't get to that, at least you've got the hook, the iconic level hook of people going, oh, that's interesting. Look at that. There's a figure there with a padlock head. All right, iconically, it's it's working so far semiotically, but what it's actually communicating, that comes later, okay? And some audiences may never get to there, but we'll talk about that in future videos. Okay, so a semiotic sign begins to function at an iconic level of the concept through resemblances to things that the target audience already knows. So here, you know, we can see in Amy's, like, just quick sketches that we're talking here about human heads, mostly male human heads, judging by the beards. So within this, just a few iconic lines and some shapes and 
different um, weights of color, or in this case, black, thin lines, heavy lines, heavy black shapes, you can convey something that's not there, which is basically a human figure. There's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no mouth, but we, through Gestalt, can fill in the rest of the details because we know what a face looks like. And that resembles faces to us. And that resemblance is a iconic level. So every line, shape, color, etc., you make in your sketches or file icons are iconic. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. Okay, I'll leave it to other academics to argue whether or not I've been really accurate in my dis description of iconic in the realms of Persian semiotic theory. But put that in the comments below and we can argue that later on. But from a point of view of a creator talking to creatives with that little bit more knowledge of Persian semiotic theory than the viewers, this is the way to start to unpack Persian semiotic theory to make that relevant into your design practice. Now, if you think of every line, shape, color, etc., you make in your sketches or final outcomes are iconic. They're the things that start to get people's attention. And yes, we are talking about aesthetics here. We'll talk about aesthetics in a few videos time, a couple of months time. But we are really talking about here the fact that you can consciously begin to craft at an iconic level your aesthetics to effectively grab the attention of your intended target audiences much better than you probably currently are. Okay, so let's just start to wrap up this week's talk. So think of iconic representation as the building blocks of all visual communication design. So from your sketchbooks out to the finished designs and finished illustrations you do, if you now start to think of it in this way, then you have always have been doing semiotics. How well you've been doing semiotics, that's another discussion for another day and for your own self-reflection on that. But really what we are talking about here is crafting things from the ideation stages after you get the brief all the way through the design process, the illustration process, right into the interpretations by your audiences and the analysis of how people then interpret what you've designed. Okay, so we're talking about a long life here where semiotics fit, fits into all of those areas. Okay, so that's where we're coming from within this one. So iconicity is based on at least perceived resemblance. And Chandler talks about that in his book and the descriptions that is in the, in the uh, comments below. So iconicity is based on at least perceived resemblance of the concept using shared qualities that help trigger recognition in the mind of the target audience. And it's that thing there, that weird qualities and that weird trigger that connects to resemblances. So by understanding your target audience, first of all, you know, what's their lived experience? What have they experienced? What, what are they familiar with? Then you can start to get a sense of, okay, when I put down colors, lines, etc., shapes, etc., then if I just shift it towards the target audience's um, experiences, the things that they know, the things that they will be able to interpret, then by crafting those qualities, you can trigger in your target audience that sense of, wow, okay, I want to look at this more, okay? It may only be a leaflet on, you know, by the best beans from the supermarket, but it can be done in many different ways to really get people to go, actually, yeah, I really, really want those beans, or I really want this, or I really want that, or I really want to do this. And that's what Jorge Frascara talks about in his book, about visual communication design as being a behavioral changer in our target audiences. And very much so, that's where I bring semiotic theory in to help you facilitate how you make that connection to your target audience, to trigger recognition in them in the mind of the audience for them to actually go, oh, this is intriguing, what's this? And obviously that's done at a subconscious level. They're not talking about that as a 
open dialogue. They're talking subconsciously about that, and that's why you want to trigger in them recognition so that you grab their attention. And there's going to be a, a, a video in um, a couple of months' time on reducing visual noise to help that trigger recognition come forward. So click the bell, click subscribe, and ensure that you're aware of that video when it comes live. Okay, so a new thing that we're going to put into these videos now, the first 11 videos, we're just setting the scene. So you can look back at the first 11 videos and the first three omnibus. And they were just sort of like setting the scene for Pierce and Pierce and semiotic theory of semiosis. So now, now that we're through that, we're going to be giving you a little bit, not homework as such, but just something to, as a takeaway. So this week's bite-sized piece of applicable semiotic knowledge is that during your ideation, in your sketching of ideas, consider as you sketch, can someone else understand your sketched ideas? Okay, so you're sketching them. And I say this all the time with students, they're very shy of drawing because they think they have to be Leonardo da Vinci, but they're not. You just have to have a good sense of iconic crafting of initial sketched ideas to get that recognition in somebody else. So obviously it's in you, but also somebody else seeing what you're sketching can go, ah, okay, I can see what you're trying to do there. Okay, that can just be within a design team, can be within your, you know, your student body around your table, but that ultimately has to then link to your target audience. So can you ensure your sketches resemble things that your target audience already knows? That's the next level of that. So we all do the first bit. We all sketch ideas out. And in that sketching of the ideas, we are we are trying to make sense of the things that are in our head and get it down our hand through our fingers, through our pens and pencils onto paper and get it out there so we can start to work on that. And we, I want to encourage everybody to still do that, okay? Preferably on paper rather than digitally. But once you've got that initial phase down, look over and go, okay, my target audience is this, they have experienced this and they've got um, triggers here, there and there. How can I shape the colors? How can I choose the colors? How can I choose the lines to resemble more the things that they know? So by doing that at the crafting stage, as you're developing your ideas, then you're hard baking in, again, using Carl um technique. So there you go, Sanjay, got that in there. You can, by carefully considering the iconic crafting, that's what I'm talking about here, the iconic crafting of your visual language from a very early sketching stage, you can help to start to enhance how your final designs will make better connections to your target audience. You'll be happy, your target audience will be happy, your client will be happy, and your client's bottom line financially will be happy because hopefully all of these things will be a win, 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 win situation. And what will help you get there is a clearer understanding of how to apply piercing semiotic theory of semiosis at an iconic crafting level into your work to enhance how you visually communicate. Okay, so that's it for this week. Come back again next week where we're moving it up one level to indexical, and we're going to look at indexical in as much detail as we've done here, and then move that in the next week after that up to symbolic again. Okay, so... Remember, subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment below, and that's it for this week. So, in this Omnibus's first video, we now see that when we discuss iconic representation in pragmatic, semiotic terms, we are talking about shared qualities with things we know or recognize. The semiotic power of iconicity in visual communication is that the visual resemblance to something we or more importantly, your audience know, kickstarts the semiotic sign action. Remember, Peirce says nothing is a semiotic sign unless it is interpreted as a sign. It is at the iconic level that this interpretation begins. Think of iconic representation as the building blocks of all visual communication design. Every line, shape, color, etc. you make 
whether in your sketches or in your final outcomes, are iconic. In last month's Omnibus 3 video, we saw how complex meaning grows from the foundations of iconic representation. Do you remember the Olympic rings? No? Well, maybe watch that video next. Iconic representation can be embedded and nested, interacting with each other to build meaning with the audience through familiarity. Sometimes that audience's interpretation never goes beyond iconic resemblance to something familiar. But from iconic, we can semiotically manipulate our creative work to point the audience towards existing things. Now that will be our focus in the next video when we examine indexical representation. In this second Omnibus video, we will now turn to the middle level of semiotic representation in semiosis, indexical. The index in a piercing context is a fresh notion. It is semiotic representation that points to existing things, just like your index finger does. You will see when we discuss indexical representation, its piercing meaning creates a whole raft of new visual communication denotative and connotative possibilities. So it is important to begin today with an open mind. As I've already said, words in different social cultural contexts have different definitions. And remember, Peirce wrote his pragmatic semiotic theory in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So, to understand indexical representation in semiosis in order to know how to apply it into visual communication design, you must bracket out any other definitions for the next 10 minutes as we explore indexicality. It will be another 30 packed 10 minutes of piercing semiosis, but in design centric terms. So, subscribe. Hit the bell. Let's go. Hi, welcome to this week's talk. Okay, so we're now moved up from iconicity and we're going to be looking at indexicality. Now, within semiosis, Peirce's semiotic theory, indexicality is the second level of representation of the concept that we need to visually communicate. So what we're seeing here is the index. Think of the index finger as a way of getting your head around indexicality because the finger points and we're going to keep coming back to this throughout today's talk. What we're looking at here is the difference between an image of a panda and an existing panda. Forget about the photograph, look through the photograph. We'll talk about photographs in the context of semiotics um, in much later detail in future videos. But right now, it's not about the photograph, it's about the panda, the existent panda. So what we have is on the left hand side, just marks, iconic marks that put in a particular uh, order and a particular composition, we get a sense of a resemblance to what's on the right hand side, a real life panda. Left hand side, it's iconic representation of the idea of these things together suggest a panda. Whereas in the photograph, and remember it's in the photograph, not the photograph, but in the photograph, we have an existent panda, an existent thing. So that thing exists. Now, obviously this is a, a full-bodied, full-blooded living creature, but it's just a, a picture, a photograph of that creature. But it could also be an existence idea. Okay, so the idea could be existence. It could be a thing, not even living. But if in your indexical representation, it is connecting that existential connection to something that does actually exist. So that's where we're going to go with this talk today on indexicality. So moving forward, indexical representation is the second subclass of a concept or representing a concept as a semiotic sign. And where it has a clear existential connection back to the original concept. So if you think about this, an index, indexical representation does not assert anything other than a statement of there, the index finger, there. 
it exists. It's something that the target audience knows is actually existing somewhere in their experience. Okay, so what we have going for us here is the fact that the concept that we are tasked to visually communicate from our brief may connect to something that is in existence. And this is where the actual idea and the knowledge of semiosis will change how you design forever. Once you understand this and are more consciously aware of the existence and the existential connections so that you can craft them in much stronger ways. So let's move forward. So the index as a representation asserts nothing. It can only say there. And this is Peirce talking. And as Peirce says, the index, the indexical representation takes hold of our eyes, as it were, and forcibly directs them to a particular object or concept in design essential terms. And there, the indexical representation stops. Don't go any further. What do we mean by that? Well, let's move forward and explore that in a little bit more depth. So, the direct existential connection that points from the semiotic sign to the concept, which is in the brief that we need to communicate, is just like an index finger that it can point to something in the real world. So making that connection, that visual connection, or strengthening that visual connection that you might already be intending to, to design for or to illustrate for, is the moment where you will change your designing forever by being more mindful of how to strengthen that existential connection in what you design to your intended target audience. How do we do that? Well, we've looked last week at iconicity, and that's the lowest level, but it still features in this level of representation. So if you think about Russian dolls, you know, those wooden um, dolls that have another doll nested inside, and then you open up that wooden doll and there's another Russian doll inside that and it keeps going down, 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 down until you get to the smallest nth degree of a Russian doll. That's how iconicness, iconicity operates within a sign. The iconicness grabs our attention, but it's only when the audience starts to interpret what we have crafted in our visual communication in the visual language that we choose within our designs and illustration that we can actually start to have a lot more um, power over how effective our visual communication is so the iconic representations are nested within the higher signs as we go through. Next week, we're going to talk about symbolic, but it's in the highest one. So if you think about them as assemblages, okay? So these are assemblages of iconicness that leads the target audience to a point where they can start interpreting more information from the iconicness. And that's where indexicality comes in. So what we have here is a poster from 1978, 1979 from Iran. And if you know your history, then you'll know around about that period of time. There was um, Iranian revolution where the Shah was overthrown and a new regime was put into place. So we can start to interpret what we're seeing here within the actual poster designs because we can see shapes within here, figure and ground again, gestalt, figure and ground, we can see shapes. We can't read the Arabic unless you can read Arabic, but we're seeing here that we can see a protest figure. Now, it could be somebody with a hood on, but an arm up in protest. And we've got black and white, so it's drawn our attention to the redness. So the red, obviously, has got some sort of symbolic, uh, sorry, it's got some sort of semiotic, um, meaning to that, but let's put the colour red to one side for now and concentrate on the the arm going up because it also could be inter interpreted on an iconic level as similar or a resemblance to a gun barrel. So here we get a people's uh, protest, which could also be an armed struggle just from a few 
iconic shapes and figure and ground, we get this bigger idea. It's only if you make the connection through knowing the history that there was a revolution in 78-79 in Iran that we have this focus that this poster indexically is pointing to a moment in history where there was a revolution. So on that note, let's move forward to the next one. In this one, um, we have a, a famous poster by Shigeo Fukuda. The previous uh, image was Morteza Mamayas. Hopefully I pronounced that right. But in this one, uh, Shigeo's poster, we again get the Gestalt figure in ground, the black and the white. And it's only when you start to analyse what we're seeing that you can start to see legs. But indexically, we can start to interpret those legs much more because we can start to put gender to those legs that the white legs are feminine and the um, black legs are essentially masculine. Well, obviously women can wear trousers as well, but in this case, we've got one form and out of the other. So it's the optical illusion of being able to see two things at once, but also only being able to focus in on one thing. So what we have here is iconically, it's making us see legs it's making us see then shoes and trousers, but it's just iconic lines. But indexically, we can go one step further than that. And indexically, we can actually start to, to interpret that as more than just legs. Indexically, it's pointing us to these are legs, but we've got multiple legs. We have a visual rhythm across the poster, which suggests it could be dance. So indexically, it's moving us up to the next, uh, another interpretation at the indexical level that what we're seeing here is dancing, okay? You could also interpret that from just the iconic shapes, that this could be anything between the 1920s to the 1930s, even 40s. You know, you might have a completely different interpretation of the period of time this could relate to, but that's my interpretation of this from my um, experiences and my knowledge and projecting that onto this poster. So it's not just about legs, indexically, we got to the point where it's legs. The resemblance suggests legs. Indexically, we are now saying these are legs, a male, female legs. But then we can indexically have another go at this and say dance. So this is the power of what you have. By understanding this level of semiotic communication, representation which is at the indexical level of pointing to existing things ideas and things that exist in the real world that we get a sense of being able to change how we design or illustrate forever because we are now understanding that what we see is something that is more than just the iconic mark making the right audience with the right information that we craft into our visual communication can then suggest bigger and more complex ideas and even existent things. So let's just move forward to the take home from this. Last week we said about having a take home within our um, videos because the first 11 videos were just setting the scene and now we're here to actually think about how to enhance your visual communication. So. My suggestion to you is now during your development, when trying to connect with your target audience, consider as you visually represent, how can you reinforce the audience's understanding what they are looking at to the concept you need to visually communicate? So think about that as you read the brief and how you can come up with the ideas to actually you know, perform like what you've been paid for or what you need to do. So it's not just about the actual technical part of your design or illustrating, but it's also the aesthetic and the visual language you use. So how can you craft your visual communication to take hold of your audience's eyes and ensure your aesthetic visual language points them to the thing you are tasked to and you need to have your audience understand, okay? So that's where we'll leave today. And next week, we'll move up one more level and we will look at symbolic representation. But that's it for this week. Thanks for watching and check in next week.
So that is the second Semiosis 101 video in this omnibus. We now see that when we discuss indexical representation in pragmatic semiotics, we are talking about how to craft our visual language to point to existing things. The semiotic power of the index in visual communication is that your audience's interpretation can be connotatively aligned with existing things, whether this is an actual place or object or idea. Remember, we have index fingers and we use our index fingers to point at things. So think of indexical representation in visual communication design as a semiotic way of connecting the audience with an existing thing that reinforces the intended message and connects to the concept we are tasked to design for. Pierce says that the index only says there. It takes hold of our eyes as it were and forcibly directs them to a particular concept and there it stops. The indexical level of representation of the concept has a more dynamic semiotic relationship with the concept than iconic but asserts nothing more to the audience. Semiotically, indexical level of representation has a clearer connection to the concept it is representing. This is more of an existential connection, which brings us to a philosophical, phenomenological level of understanding visual communication design's power to communicate. Our focus in the final video in this omnibus will build on iconic and indexical representation levels and end with the highest level, symbolic. The symbol in a Persian context is not what you may understand symbol to mean. You will see that when we discuss symbolic representation in Persian meaning differs from your previous understanding and application of the word symbolic. So it is important to begin this video, like the previous two, with an open mind. Remember, words in different social cultural contexts have different definitions, and Peirce did write this pragmatic semiotic theory in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. So to understand symbolic representation in semiosis, in order to understand how to apply it into visual communication design, you must, again, bracket out any other definitions for the next 10 minutes as we explore symbolic representation. It will be another 30 packed 10 minutes of Peirce's semiosis in designer centric terms. So stay tuned, subscribe, let's go. Okay, welcome to this week's talk. The previous two weeks we were focusing on iconicity and indexical. Now we're moving up to the last of that and the highest, not just the last, but also the highest visual representation within semiotics of symbolic. We've talked before about symbolic and about putting your ideas about what this means to one side. And let's just focus in on symbolic from the point of view of Pierce. So unlike iconic or indexical representation, symbolic representation demands neither resemblance to its concept. So that's what we're obviously designing from, from the brief. So it doesn't necessarily need resemblance to that concept, nor an existential connection or bond with it. The symbolic sign eludes individual will. Now, what do we mean by that? Okay, so this idea of the symbolic sign eludes individual will. Well, symbolic representation of the concept we need to visually communicate means that it is a general semiotic sign. Now, that is a bit of a straightaway a thing where something that is so high and powerful within the the three levels of representation, semiotic representation of the concept, to say that by the time you get to the highest level, it's just general. But there is real importance behind that, okay, what we mean by general. Because where its interpretation by the target audience, our target audience, arises from a general social cultural agreement of meaning. What I mean by that is within society, within our culture, we accept that when we see certain things together visually, it means a bigger concept. So we play on that idea when it comes to branding, etc., or any other form of symbolic 
visual communication in illustration, graphic design, design in general, but especially we're talking about within Brandon, that what we have is at this highest level, if we craft this highest level well, we can definitely have people accept that when they see that, it means this now. And this connection from that is socially and culturally agreed amongst those people. Okay? To anybody else, it won't mean anything. But to this group of people, that context, it now means this. Okay? So let's move forward. And let's explore what we mean a little bit further about symbolically and how to represent ideas. Okay, so we, we must distinguish, first of all, clearly between a depiction or image, as Peirce would say, and an emblem. An emblem is a mixed sign, partially iconic and partially symbolic. So I've just thrown that word in there, emblem. You know, it comes from Woolen's um, book on semiotics within film, within cinema. But emblem, it's emblematic. It suggests something else. So as a symbol level, let's just refer to that now in our context of visual communication as a logo. And look at this um, World Wildlife Fund um, Foundation of um, this you know, recognizable logo featuring a panda. What do we mean by the fact that we've got the image, the depiction and the emblem? Well, when it's all put together in the logo, that's when it's emblematic. That's when it's symbolic because it's no longer about the, 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 the panda. It's about the bigger concept of, you know, preserving our, you know, our planet's wildlife in its natural habitats so that, you know, we have a future for our generations that come after us. So there's a difference there between the iconicness of the elements that come together, the forms, the panda. And we can see that on the right-hand side where I've passed the individual iconicness of that panda shape to one place. Whereas when it's configured together into the logo, that that now refers to the WWF. Okay, so it's partly iconic because the elements that come together grab our attention but now it's pointing us to a panda so we've already looked last week about indexicality about the fact that we can make a, a jump from indexical to an existing panda and we can see that now and that's how this logo helps us see that when we see these shapes in this particular order it suggests a panda but we're now talking about it at a symbolic level so it's not just a panda anymore. This is an emblem, a logo that speaks on behalf of all endangered species. So already that image has gone from iconic to indexical and from indexical to symbolic because it's got an agreed meaning that when we see this, it means that. Okay. When we see that, it means this. So we're already moving up in power. So let's move forward. Again, a genuine symbol, and this is what Pierce says, a genuine symbol is a symbol that has general meaning. General in the sense that more than one person can agree that when they see this, it means that. You don't have to have a debate about it. That it's commonly agreed that when we see this, we think of Coca-Cola. But all it is is just red and white and a curved shape but it has general meaning now that refers to you know coca-cola and all its ranges but all it is is just iconic shapes so again we've got iconicness just the shapes and the color that put together now suggests to us who are within a society and the culture that is aware of a product called coca-cola then we can then go coca-cola indexically it points us to that particular brand of coca-cola so when we now see this together we know it's coca-cola and that's the same image that was first of all iconic is now working at that symbolic level so a symbol once in being spreads among the peoples 
in use and in experience, its meaning grows. So just as the same way as it went from iconic to indexical in a flick of the eye, and from indexical to symbolic, this is because we have agreed that this particular shape, these particular colors, means Coca-Cola. So that's where the general meaning comes in. So that's where the power of the visual representation jumps up to where it is at that function at the highest level. If you don't know what Coca-Cola is, you will just see the red and the white and this shape. If you know that this shape, it, the same image just moves to indexical. And with the movement to indexical, as soon as you get Coca-Cola, then you realize that this is part of a bigger uh, symbolic representation of Coca-Cola as a brand, as a drink, etc. The image has done nothing. It hasn't changed. It's just the target audience bringing more of their own experience into their interpretation to get the meaning from something that is just a couple of colors next to each other. So this is where, you know, our idea behind logos and other elements of visual communication at the highest functional level of trying to communicate the meaning of the concept that we need to visually communicate can work. But it only works at that higher level if our audience can interpret it and has enough knowledge to accept it as a general meaning of something else. So this is where... Branding and everything else that we do within design at the higher functional levels can't work without semiosis, okay? You don't need to know it's semiosis because you can interpret this in many different ways or you can apply different theories to how this works, and that's perfectly fine. But this is obviously all in the context of semiosis. So what we have is essentially a way of explaining how something can go from just a couple of colors to a big branded experience of this is that. Okay, so let's just move one step further and just wrap up this week's talk. So what we have is a symbol is a sign which refers to the concept that it denotes by virtue of a law. Peirce calls it a law. By the time it gets to this highest level, it's set in place in a social cultural context that when we see this, it means that. There's never been a committee set now and saying, right, this means that. But it's it's just by symbiosis. People just accept that when they see this, it means that. So usually an association of general ideas which operates to cause the symbol to be interpreted as referring to the concept that we started from. So this is where Pierce is really, really important to us as designers and illustrators because Despite his problematic terminology most of the time, his thinking really helps us explain to ourselves first and foremost the power of what we do as a career path, that we visually communicate, we craft visual language to actually communicate maybe to just one person at an iconic level or a, 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 an idea to exist on things at the indexical level or even on a more general basis to more and more people just through you know a simple shape which is iconic but this shape when you see it now if you see it as nike then you can see that it's actually working at that higher symbolic level now all you need to see is this swoosh and straight away you're thinking nike if you, if you didn't know what nike was you wouldn't get that connection Okay, so let's move to the last um, part of today's talk. So, as I've said in the previous two videos, this is a new section going forward for the remainder of Season 1 of the Semiosis 101 videos. In the first 11 videos, we were just setting in place all the, the knowledge about Pierce's Semiosis as a theory to help visual communication designers and illustrators now, here's the take-home bits. This is how you can start to think of your practice more semiotically as you do it, as you create these things. So, 
Joining your development, when trying to develop branding, a logo, a corporate identity, consider crafting the iconic hooks. And in designing a brand archetype, more so than a word type, consider how the emblematic symbolic nature of the visual language that you choose to grab the attention is built up from the iconic building blocks. So we can see there Nike, it's a swoosh. Iconically, it's a swoosh. It's this sort of like shape. But through symbolic level of social uh, cultural connections, it, it now means Nike. Nothing else, no other um, brand, it means Nike. And that is the iconic movement to the symbolic. Okay, So audiences learn to associate what they see with a perception of and a feeling toward what is being branded. And this agreed association is semiotically crafted by yourselves. So by just now being aware of the power that is in your hands and your heads, you can really start to focus your attention in the right places, semiotically speaking, to enhance how you visually communicate. So that's it for this week. Come back again next week when we'll have another talk. And that's it for now. So don't forget, subscribe, hit the like, hit the bell, and leave a comment as well if you want to. But that's it for this week. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. So that was our final 10 minutes of Percy and Semiosis 101 in this month's Omnibus. Well, that was an eye-opener. Symbolic representation in pragmatic semiotics as a specific context different from symbolism and other uses of the word symbol. It is crucial to remember on this Scouse Scott Semiosis 101 channel that the words Pierce uses will have different meanings in other design contexts. This is an unfortunate problem that is not Charles Sanders Pierce's fault. Words are elastic and can mean something different in other design contexts. The semiotic power of symbolic representation in semiosis within visual communication design is that at this higher semiotic level, your audience is crucial in developing effective visual language and semiosis, which helps you craft it. You see, when I teach semiosis at university to design students, the biggest confusion I see in the students' stress levels is whether a sign is iconic or symbolic. In their young designers' eyes, they are very similar in appearance. What is difficult to grasp at first is that the basic iconic building blocks are clearly present in symbolic representation. After all, the resemblance to qualities already known is the beginning of the act of semiosis. Now these nested iconic elements inside symbolic visual communication the symbolic level of representation of the concept creates general semiotic signs. Symbolic meaning is a general agreement. It is agreed by the audience themselves who have to learn it through socialization within a culture, their culture. What I mean by this is that a grouping of iconic colors, lines and shapes in a particular formation can symbolically come to mean a concept. Just think of any brand's logo. Iconic elements configured into a design that stands within a social cultural context for a company, a service, a product, an idea, etc. The secret here lies with the audience's interpretation. If only a resemblance to something already known is recognized, a piece of visual communication will only semiotically communicate at an iconic level. If the same piece of visual communication is recognized as pointing to an existing thing, then the audience makes more advanced interpretation of the concept at an indexical level. Now, if the very same piece of visual communication is generally agreed to mean something within a social cultural context, then it operates at the highest semiotic level of symbolism. If at the iconic level, the audience makes no connection to anything known, then the same piece of visual communication won't perform semiotically at all. Therefore, within Pierce semiosis, the visual communicator and the intended audience are 
intertwined within a sign action determination flow. Now next month's Semiosis 101 videos, we will expand on iconic indexical and symbolic representation and how audiences are existentially linked into our semiotically led design process by going a bit deeper into the phenomenological philosophical underpinning of Peirce's semiotic theory to the things themselves. I hope as creatives you agree that Peirce's semiotic theory of semiosis offers a lot of rich pickings to enhance our visual communication skills. So come back again and if you enjoyed this omnibus then please like these videos, subscribe to the channel below and if you want to be notified when the next new video is available hit the bell button. If you've watched these videos before you probably know by now I'm Dave Wood, a design educator and researcher, a published design author and I've worked commercially as both a freelance illustrator and a graphic designer. The guy behind the theory, Charles Sanders Peirce, was a philosopher, a mathematician and a theorist, but he wasn't a creative. Each week on this Scout Scott Semiosis 101 YouTube channel, I'll post at least one 10 minute explainer video on an aspect of Peirce's pragmatic semiotic theory. Every month I'll then post an omnibus edition from those videos. Each free Semiosis 101 10 minute video uses designer centric terms instead of theoretical language so that illustrators and graphic designers can understand. Each video will feature a take home piece of applicable semiotic theory and they do interconnect to build up your understanding of semiosis. This channel is not a course on semiotics per se. Instead, think of each video as a bite sized illustrated piece of new knowledge on sign action or semiosis as Peirce names it. The aim of these three videos is to take Peirce's quite complex philosophical theoretical language and put it in the context of designing visual communication, whether these are illustrations, motion, brand and packaging, editorial, etc. By subscribing to the Scout Scott YouTube channel, you will learn how Peirce's pragmatic semiotic theory of semiosis can help to enhance and improve how you visually communicate. Now I do have many more Peircean semiotic topics to discuss, but I'd be interested in hearing about your semiotic ideas. Add a comment below. And if you like this video, check out my other semiotic videos and consider liking and sharing those videos with others. You see, the more we creatives discuss semiotic theory, the easier its application into our creative processes will be. As a fellow creative and a published design author, I have a link in the description to my Scout Scott website where you can find all the Semiosis 101 videos and read background info on the blog, download free Semiosis 101 video transcripts and reading lists, buy illustrated and typographical gift ranges on my Redbubble shop, but also you can buy my 2014 design book published by Bloomsbury Publishing, Interface Design and Introduction to Visual Communication in UI Design. Over the years, I have collaborated with other design academic researchers and Peircean semioticians to develop a designer-centric explanation of Peirce's theoretical language. Now, if you are interested in reading my semiotic Rosetta Stone academic writing, then you can visit my academia.edu link in the description. Any other books on Peircean semiotics or design I've mentioned in the videos are also listed in the description. Check them out too. Thanks for watching this Omnibus. There'll be another Omnibus edition next month and a new weekly 10 minute Semiosis 101 video next week. Check out all the other Scout Scott Semiosis 101 videos, like and share them with your friends and hit the bell and subscribe buttons to be notified when next week's video is published. You can also follow Semiosis 101 on the socials for updates. It's Scouts underscore Scott on Instagram and Semiosis 101 on Twitter. So see you all again next week for more Semiosis 101 to help illustrators and designers to enhance your visual communication skills.